today we'll be exploring the fundamentals of any programming how a programming is to be taught which can actually create interest in students so most of us uh, start from anywhere mentioned according to the syllabus and uh, even teachers find it hard to start it like that i have gone through the same cycle but uh, however i was fortunate enough to have been uh, trained by one of my earlier mentors who taught a very nice way to introduce coding to anybody first time learners so i would like to share that piece of knowledge with you all today so i will quickly finish it and last few minutes we can take it, keep it open to discuss so any kind of it could be anything silly please feel free to ask all your questions so that we can resolve and go ahead programming has become one of the empowering skills we may not be teaching it but it's always good to know yeah i'll share my screen i'll be using this whiteboard i request all the participants to mute yourselves unless we open it for discussion hope you are able to see my screen is my screen visible to all of you i'm assuming you are able to see my screen i'll begin so programming language is a concept while different programming languages are technologies so programming language any programming language is a concept sorry yeah it's a concept what they help in doing is to automate the systems to automate everything around us through computer programming so there are multiple programming languages to name few the famous ones we know java javascript python c c++ and many more julia so we have so many programming languages we are going to discuss the common things general things now today with respect to any programming language uh anybody here in the room can you tell me how do we start teaching programming languages basically i mean typically how do we start yeah i see uh, professor prashant here would you like to add some light yes ma'am uh, starting we first we uh, give the like we tell them the what is the logic behind the program Mm -hmm. then we start with algorithm or a flow chart then right. the main code right yeah that's a typical way but let us try out uh, first thing we should give the landscape when the students learn what are they learning and uh, how should they be going ahead so we have typically three dimensions to any programming language so the first dimension first dimension of any programming language uh, remember it's not specific to any particular programming language it is in general the first basic element of any programming language is a variable so the first element the fundamental element of any programming language is variables variables are used to store or save information or hold the data and the next one is data types so what are the different data types that a variable can hold example numerical character string different types of data that it can hold and the third one we have operators all the mathematical operators addition subtraction all of these are common they don't change with respect to any language operators then we have statements or expressions statements in the sense a line of instruction statements or they are also called as expressions and then we have conditional statements that is if else so 
So conditional statements. And then we have looping constructs. We'll check what these are. Then we have functions. And then we have libraries. So these are the key terms, which a first dimension of programming language will consist of any programming language. So variables are the elements which hold the data and data types. It could be int, float, uh, all of those which you have heard, they come in data types, string, characters. Then operators are all the mathematical operators. Statement is a line of code which we use all of these variables, data types, operators to make one line of code, which is statement. Then conditional statements. Whenever we talk to computers, it's always in the form of putting conditions there. If this logic, then do this. If this logic satisfies, if this condition satisfies, then do this. If not, do this. So that's the only way we can communicate with computers. We can automate things. We can explain outside world uh, to the computer in the form of conditions. And we also need something called looping constructs. They help in repeating the things. Say, suppose uh, I'll show you all of these. So uh, they help in repeating some things. So for this, we need looping constructs. So for conditional statements, we have if, else, these are typical and they change with respect to programming languages. Some rules will change, but they are the same. How they work is all the same. If, else, for looping, to repeat something, we will have for or while. And different languages will have uh, multiple things, but more or less they are the same. So functions are small blocks of codes which we can use repetitively. We keep we, we give a general name to the function. We keep changing the inputs. The output will be the same, whatever logic you will have written. And group of multiple functions will give rise to one particular library. So these are the first dimensions of any programming language. Only the rules will differ. So, so suppose I take Python, the rules to declare Python variables are different. The data types, the way we declare data types in every language is different. Operators, the basic mathematical operators will be same, but uh, some will change, may change, but more or less operators are universal. They don't try to change there a lot because people cannot interpret. So uh, again, in statements, the way we write, they may differ slightly with respect to different programming languages, but any programming language you take, you will have all of these elements, first dimension. So many people feel after completing first dimension, they are experts or they have already learned programming language, which is not true. They are only the foundational elements of a programming language. Only with this, you cannot build anything. There is a lot we have to learn to actually be able to build something. So most of them teach only the first dimensional elements and give you a certificate saying you know Python or you're certified Python programmer. The moment uh, students are asked to build something, they are unable to do because they are limited only with first dimension. So just remember first dimension is the beginning, it's not the end. So these are all the first dimensional aspects. Uh, if I take Python, I'll just show how all these... Uh, can be programmed in a very quickly, not in depth. So I will be showing it in Python. I have an ID. IDE is called Integrated Development Environment, which is used to write the code compile, interpret, and see the output. So this is, Jupyter is one of the IDEs to run Python codes. So variable, so I'll take, I, I want to just hold a number, two numbers and try to add them. NUM, when I say this is a variable, variables are always on the left-hand side. So left-hand side variable, on the right, after the equal to sign, whatever we have, that is data type. So integers are any numbers which can be given 
directly here in Python. Whereas in other languages, you have to mention int or whatever. Here it is assumed in Python. So there are rules to declare these variables. So in Python, there is a rule that it cannot start with, I'll run this, it is holding it. There is no output because 45 is added into the variable uh, num, num, you can have any numbers. So there are rules for Python variables. It cannot start with a number. So if I try to start with number and save some information, try to run it, it will say, it will throw an error, okay? And it's case sensitive. The variables in Python are case sensitive, capital and uh, all of this. And it cannot have special characters. It cannot have white spaces. So if I want to have full name stored, strings are to be stored in double or single quotes. If I want to write my name, uh, here on the left side, you cannot have space. It will throw an error. So instead, what is allowed, underscore is allowed in Python. So now it works. If I have to print it, I'll just call this variable name. Let us not go in depth, I'm just demonstrating it. So this is how, underscore is allowed. So there are some rules for every variable declaration in every programming language. We should explore the rules. First dimension we should show to the students and tell them uh, to explore the variables by themselves. What are the rules of uh, declaring variables in Java? What are the rules of declaring variables in Julian? So they will first find out. Rules are to be known first. Otherwise, it's a frustrating process. You don't know why some error is happening. It might be very silly, but you will spend a lot of uh, time in debugging that. So rules are to be made quite clear. So conditional statement, you write if something is greater. Uh, so the conditions. So I'll take two numbers, a variable 34, B equal to 45. I want to check which one is greater. We obviously know, but the answer should be coming from the computer. A computer will analyze these two numbers and say which one is greater. I'll write a code. Here comes the conditional statement. If, I'll write the logic here. A is greater than B. I'll put a colon. These are all rules. Putting a colon there and writing if, and then having space here and starting from here. So print in double quotes, all the messages are to be given in. So this is how I write. If not, I have else. So these are the rules. So here the computer checks. Now say so now if I change this, it works. So these are conditional statements, if and else. This is how the computer uh, understand the logic. So we have to be, we should be able to write the logic. Not knowing the logic is a different problem. It's not the inability to understand programming language. Many, many students will not know logic. If I ask you, uh, give a logic to find uh, even numbers, they will say every alternate number is an even number, which is a wrong logic. You cannot really help such students when their school basic mathematics are not strong. Programming can be taught, but logic should be, com should be coming from their school uh, times. You know? Yeah. So looping. Say if I want to print numbers, say I'll print, I want to print a number one here, just one. So it will print one. What if I have to print 10 numbers? I should say print one, print two, print three till 10. What if I want to print thousand numbers? I have to keep repeating this, right? To repeat that, there is looping construct called for. So for I or anything, it's, it need not be I, it could be anything. In all these are rules which I'm using. Starting point from where it should start and say I want to start it till I want to have it till 1000, I'll give a number extra. And I'll say, print whatever is stored. So whatever gets stored in num, first num will take zero, then it will take one, num will take two, three, four, and so on. It will keep printing. So now if you see, it has repeated, the loop has repeated itself to give me numbers till whatever I have expected. Otherwise you would have, you should have used the print statement thousand times to print thousand numbers. So that's the role of uh, looping constructs for, and there is also a while loop. There are two ways to achieve looping constructs for and while. So 
all these other things. Then we have functional statements. Oh, sorry, functions. Functions are small pieces of codes which could be used often. So they are written like this. Say I want to write a function to add two numbers. I'll uh, name of, I'll give any random name, add, it could be anything, okay? Uh, but it should be meaningful. It should be a meaningful name. So I'll just write add numbers is the name of my function. I'll take two numbers. I'll give general ones, A and B. What I have to do is I'll take another number variable C, which will hold the addition of two. And ultimately I want to print whatever is saved in C. So this will be defining a function. I'll run it. So function is defined. Once I create it, I can call this function with its name and give any kind of number. A and B are general. I can put any numbers in them. 56, it gives the answer. Now I'll use again the same function and give a very big number. Run it, it will give me the answer. So these are functions. Name of the function and A and B. I can give anything here any big number, it will keep doing working on that logic. So these are functions. We write the logic once and we keep calling its name, giving uh, the inputs, the different different inputs we give so that it will keep generating. So that, those are called functions, repetitive usage. So suppose I try to give more than what I have specified. I've given only A and B. If I try to give three numbers now, a, B, C, A, B, whatever, three, it, it will not work. It will say it takes only two arguments, but we are giving three. So in your defining the function, you are given only two numbers and now you're trying to add three numbers, it will not work. So these are called functions. So many such functions bundled up together, they are called libraries. So all of this will uh, constitute first dimension of any programming language. Now, what is the second dimension? of any programming language. So let's repeat the first dimensional uh, things of any programming language. Uh, it's variables, data types. So we have three pillars. Any programming language will have variables, data types, whichever is stored after the equal to sign you assign. Data types, then plus, minus, comparator, operators, all of these. Then we have statements. And then we have conditional statements. That is, we just saw if and else. Conditional statements. Then we have loops, looping constructs used to repeat things. And then we will have functions, small pieces of codes, which you can use to repeat with different inputs. Then group of similar functions will uh, constitute a library. So this forms the first dimension of a programming language. Now the second dimension. So this is the style of programming. The way you program. Programming is to build, uh, automate some things. So your WhatsApp, Facebook, they are all, uh, there are codes written to build them, those applications. There is some style. The most famous style, or they are also called pro programming paradigms the way you program them. Object-oriented programming is one of the famous styles of programming. It's called OOPS, where every uh, object, I mean, whatever the outside world modeling to the computers are shown in the form of objects and classes. So uh, it's a very easy, I mean, it's an efficient way to program. Say, I can give you an analogy here, style. When you want to build a house, the purpose of the house is same, that uh, it, it should provide security. There are, there are windows, doors, and four walls, roof. But the style of home, whether it's a wooden house or a uh, house with uh, you know, uh, RCC flooring or uh, different houses can be there. The same way, when you're building something with programming languages, the styles may differ. You can choose the styles, uh, object-oriented programming, uh, functional programming. Then there is procedural so some of the languages support a few of these styles. Python supports all of these programming styles. C was a procedural language. Java, Python, uh, Java is uh, object-oriented programming. So suppose we have uh, WhatsApp, right? I'll give you an example. WhatsApp code is all built in object-oriented programming style. So any updates, if, if there are any up updates, 
uh, our WhatsApp doesn't stop, right? Updates are just pushed in the existing code. We just have to update our app and it will get embedded. So all that luxury is provided if the program is, the, if the application is built through object-oriented style. If, you know, it will be difficult if you are having any other ways, you have to stop the entire code and then push something which is not feasible. So most of them prefer object-oriented programming style where you have classes, objects, uh, and there are features like uh, abstraction and there are many features of object-oriented programming language. So Python supports all of these programming styles and this is not an overnight task. You can just introduce your students with these styles, but to master them, they will have to work on projects for at least two or three years. They cannot uh, become masters in these styles by just one or two programs or even one project. They have to be working for years to call themselves masters in these uh, uh, methodologies. So the third important element is application specific libraries, which are important for any programming language. Say if I want to de develop web website or web uh, application, then the libraries are entirely different in any programming language. For example, in Python, if I want to build web applications, I will have Django, D is silent. We call it as Django, then there is Flask, and there is throttle, bottle, so many. These are the libraries which we learn in Python when we want to build web applications. Suppose I want to learn AI and machine learning, then the libraries used are different. We have TensorFlow, we have Scikit-learn, have Pandas, we have uh, NumPy. So all these are different pro. Uh, all these are different libraries for different applications. If I'm a testing engineer in Python, then the libraries used are all different. So whenever we are learning Python, we should know which libraries we are learning because we cannot say, I, I know Python, which is a very wrong way to show, which is an immature way of telling what you know. We have to tell, or we have, our student should be able to tell, I have built this using, uh, Python. That means I have built a recommendation engine, AI recommendation engine using Python. Then the interviewer or the industry people will know, you know TensorFlow, you know Pandas, you know NumPy, and you know all of these. So most of them refer, uh, when they say, I know Python, they are only referring to first dimension, which is of no use. They should be knowing to build some applications. So uh, always choose, do not say, I will learn to build web app, I will be an AI, uh, ML expert, I will be a testing expert, even for uh, to build, uh, develop games, there are different uh, uh, libraries. So all of them you cannot be learning. So when we say we train people on AI and machine learning, we commit only to the libraries which are with respect to AI and machine learning. So TensorFlow, Pandas, and all of this. So these are the three dimensions in which any programming language to the students has to be taught. First dimension, they are all default. Every programming language, they have the same landscape. It will not differ. I spoke with respect to Python, but all of them have the same things. There are libraries in Java for applications and uh, uh, styles, object-oriented programming in Java, and these remain the same. So these are the ways the programming languages have to be introduced to students. So choose your applications and uh, choose the style based on that you will know which uh, language to use and these will be the basics. So that's all about uh, programming languages, the fundamentals. We can have always more to learn, but I think in the given time, this is all I could cover. So hope the things are clear. Please uh, open up for any questions if you have. No questions are silly. Please feel free to ask. Uh, Chetna, hi. Uh, yeah. Yogesh Vagli here from Bombay and London. How are you? It's a pleasure to have you. Please tell me. Yes, my question, I mean, yours, I mean, AML and all this is really beautiful stuff. In fact, I have been following it up. I couldn't catch up with you in Thai Hubli, but mm -hmm. I am always, uh, you can say, following your activity, yours or the Pali Gotar case. Really, it's marvelous. I mean, now I would like to ask you one simple question. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in India, there is a lot, lot being changes in the new education policy. So mm -hmm. I would like to ask you that how, how, what you what is your viewpoint 
will it synergize with the new education policy which is really creating ripples in the uh, overall world of education what's your feel on that i think the curriculum is really exciting and it may be difficult for all the educators to adapt initially uh, but it is very i mean a lot empowering people, the, the syllabus is interdisciplinary and uh, people are learning in the end we always saw that any subject is connected to all other subjects we have been learning uh, them discreetly because of uh, constraints of time or resources but now the dots are all being connected uh, so i think nep is tough to uh, you know start rolling up but once it takes off i think it's the best it's it's become interdisciplinary people have choice and uh, everything is seen as an art and everything is given weightage not like earlier only math science and even, uh, literature was ignored or so i think it's a it's a great wave which we are we all would be riding thanks thanks for your query yeah thank you so much and any any more questions on these technical aspects programming languages yep please okay one query i am having yeah now again i one query yeah yes uh, it's a well known fact that i do have my own setup also in tel aviv israel mm -hmm. israel is called the mother of the ai and all this okay. so are you looking for collaborations in your own field in israel uh, mm -hmm. a joint indo israel initiative so it can really create wonders in the integrated startup ecosystem because let me tell you chetna i have seen you know the joke in ai it and all i always seen that except for the fintech none of the sectors actually integrate your field i mean your it i would say it's a neglected state of affairs when it except for the fintech rest is all ho hollow so mm -hmm. actually we are also interested in working out uh, certain things with you which i will uh, discuss with you on the pp but right. i would like to ask you one simple question is that are you interested because look lot of israeli companies want a collaborative partner who is mm -hmm. having joint who is a part and parcel of the joint indo israel initiative right. so will you be interested uh, yeah so definitely we are into uh, training of uh, ai and machine learning technologies uh, at the same time we are not committing to any industrial projects because that becomes a different ball game we tried a uh, few initially we cannot be balancing both training and development so we choose to only train uh, if it comes to any projects or development we don't have a team uh, which can develop we have trainers and we train and we take projects to only upskill our own uh, knowledge base to make our training sufficient uh, but if it is something to projects uh, we don't but trainings yes we are always in okay one one question related to the same field now yeah. when you talk about training so you you your priority is training fair enough now if there are many israeli british companies who would love to get associated as a part of joint indo israel or indo british initiative for training for right. training only yeah yeah so training we are always uh, no we welcome with open arms great thank yeah. thanks thank you so much for the opportunity uh, so i would like to ask uh, others please open up if you have any queries related to programming languages was the session clear did it add any kind of value with respect to your knowledge base of programming language uh, hi ma'am this is much shake uh, yes uh, this session yeah ma'am uh, this is the first time i'm hearing like a lecture on uh, this programming languages mm -hmm. because i come from a biology background Right. So, how do you think this uh, topic will help me in my subject, programming it, languages in biology? Yeah. So, well, I, uh, biology will be an application of programming language. So, if you want to build something, anything that you want to automate, you need to learn a programming language. So, mm -hmm. uh, the computer science 
whatever programming languages, they don't stand alone. They always tie up with some applications. It's the computer science person who learns your biology to build a solution or biology expert like you who will learn programming languages and build your solution on by your own self. That is the thing. So any, any application, we can embed programming languages to automate things. So there's a long way to go. If uh, if you're getting any uh, anything automated by some programming expert, if you have basic knowledge, you will know what exactly that person is doing for you. You can get it done. Or if you want to try out your own hands, then you can learn programming languages in depth and try to uh, build an application in your own uh, field. Okay. Yeah. I mean, research and stuff like that, it will be more helpful. Yeah. So... And uh, all the teachers are, uh, you know, pushed to, uh, you know, recently I heard that even mathematic professors are uh, pushed to learn programming languages in engineering colleges because they all want it to be automated. They don't want to sit and solve pages together, some uh, things, because there are functions already built in. Only the concepts are taught by the teachers, but implementation is done through programming languages like integration, differentiation. There are functions. Mm -hmm. So Laplace transforms, they teach the concept and then they have to do it in the programming manner. Nobody is there now, the word is changed. There are functions for everything and they have to use it directly. So mathematics people are pushed to learn programming languages now. Similarly, it could be the case for all of you. They will ask you to replace all your manual tasks into program-based things where we should know how to get the things done. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. So any more questions? So was it uh, too difficult for the non-programming uh, background people to understand this, whatever we said today? No, I don't think, but we didn't understand completely in depth, like how the process will actually work. But we got yeah, a basic so we didn't idea even dive there. deep. We just showed the landscape in any programming yeah. language. What are the three dimensions and how a programming language has to be taught? The first dimension mm -hmm. elements, these are to be taught to the students, then go to the next, next. And ultimately, they should be able to build even a small application, a small game, uh, mm -hmm. so that they have connect with all these three dimensions. So most of them, they learn only the first dimension and say, I'm a programmer of uh, Python, I know Python, but uh, that's how they fail when they go to jobs, they don't know to build anything. So the gist is learn all the three dimensions. The second one will take a lot of time, but first and the third dimension, the fundamentals and the application library part, we should be really good at when we have to be, or when we are uh, attending interviews, they will ask, what have you built? Okay. So, any more questions on these? So, please open up if you have any questions on programming languages. Yeah. So I gave a lot of time for interaction today because uh, every session we used to occupy the entire session and keep teachers audience as a mute spectator. So we just thought we'll open up. I'll finish exactly in 20, 25 minutes and give the rest 15 minutes, last 15 minutes for discussion. So I also request you people to come up with any topic, you know, this is a free platform where don't be hesitant about anything. Uh, it could, if you think this topic is going to add value in some way, then please come up. As long as there are uh, no outside participants, I will be sharing my knowledge. The whole intention is to keep this series consistent and continued. So it, it can make difference. Anything which is consistent can only make difference going ahead. So this is what we strongly believe in. And uh, please come up with any topics of your choice and try to connect with uh, fellow educators and share your knowledge with them. So thank you so much, all of you for being here. I think there are, uh, I'm assuming there are no questions and uh, trying to sign off now. Is that okay? One question? Yeah, yeah. Yes, Mr. Srinivas. Yeah. Uh, there are two questions actually. 
Okay. As a counselor, I want to ask you: mm -hmm. uh, Is it necessary that every student should mm -hmm. be trained for uh, AI and machine learning? And the second thing: Do you think every teacher should learn these techniques? Every teacher, yes. Every student, yes. But the way they learn differs. If because these days AI tools are becoming just drag and drop options. It's not uh, okay. that you have to code. So people who develop AI ML are different. People who use AI ML are different. So when I say, should they be trained in AI ML? Yes, for everybody should do that, teachers and students. But everybody need not be developing solutions for AI. We should know how we should be uh, able to use it. That's it. Okay. okay. Yeah. So developers could be only from engineering background or hardcore hobbyists of AI, respective of background. But users, because in uh, even in Excel and Power BI or all these dashboards, there are AI features implemented. We are all using them already, with or without knowing that this we are users of AI. Yeah. Yeah, hope that answers. Uh, you had another question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think the time is up. Let us make.